uh, for joining us today. And I'm here to uh, talk about stoneflies. I, I work for the US Geological Survey and the Columbia Environmental Research Center in uh, Columbia, Missouri. And uh, I have spent most of my career uh, looking at the effects of uh, of perturbations on, on stream macroinvertebrate communities. And uh, some of this uh, material I'm gonna present today is actually from uh, my graduate research back in the 1980s, which is the last extensive uh, work that has been done on stoneflies in the Ozark region. But uh, for stoneflies, the, uh, at least the, the classification at the family level has remained relatively stable in comparison to the mayflies and castflies where we've had more changes in the families. So uh, that helps a little bit. There are fewer families to talk about, but I'm also going to uh, cover some ecology and, and uh, life history information in this talk as, as well. Uh, okay, so we're talking about Plecoptera, which is the P and the EPT and insects. And if you remember, uh, stoneflies have a combination of two tarsal claws at the end of each uh, uh, appendage versus one. And they usually have two, they all, always have two tails. And so this is one of the three primary orders of, uh, of insects inhabiting freshwater streams and rivers. And uh, stoneflies uh, originally came from uh, this idea that they would always emerge on streamside cobblestones. Well, as you'll see later on in this presentation, they actually like a lot of other stream habitats too, and not just stones, but uh, I found this picture and thought it was kind of fitting for a stonefly talk since it's uh, got lots of large rocks and cobbles, but they, they will emerge on other streamside substrates as well. Uh, the word plecoptera actually, uh, uh, actually uh, is uh, a scientific name referring to pleated wing, and a pleat is a longitudinal fold or more than one fold that allows the stoneflies to actually uh, fold all four of its wings uh, flat over its back, more or less flat uh, at rest. Uh, you might see the end of the wings uh, slightly curled around the abdomen in some, in some species. This is where the name comes from, and the, the, uh, the hidden portion of the wing is actually larger and a lot more obvious in the hind wing. So if you were to take the, the wings on, a, on an adult and, and spread them out, um, you would see that, that that lobe is actually quite a bit larger on the, on the hind wings, depending, depending on the family. In, uh, in Missouri, uh, we've got uh, eight of the nine families that are known from North America. Um, in the world, we've got uh, 17 families. A couple of those are only known from the fossil record. And, uh, and so in North America, we've got nine families. The Pel Perlidae is the only family that is presumed absent in Missouri. They've never been collected in, in, in Missouri or in the Ozark region. They're pretty common in the Appalachians and in the Rockies, but we've never actually collected them, even though we've looked for them. So we've got 73 species in Missouri, and of the 25 species that are endemic to the Ozarks, uh, Missouri has 14 of those. And we have uh, nine species of conservation concern. And as you can see, the breakdown in the season here, we're talking about the emergence uh, 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 to the adult stage. You can see that, <laughs> that you know, more than three quarters of our species emerge in the winter and the spring months. And so by summertime, uh, you know, there's still a lot of uh, stoneflies emerging, but the diversity of emergence is, is lower. Uh, because we have so much a higher diversity in the in the winter and spring, and it's in particular uh, the three families of winter emerging species: the Capneidae, Teneopterygidae, and Lutridae. Um, you can see that the winter emerging species; and those three families make up uh, more than one third of our fauna. So you can see how easy it would be for a lot of monitoring programs and sampling programs that we have for monitoring to miss those three families entirely. And this is one of the reasons why uh, sometimes uh, they're not very common in collections is because you really have to go out in the winter months to get those. Stoneflies are highly adapted to uh, water that has uh, adequate amounts of oxygen. They're, they're usually 
adapted to highly ox oxygenated environments. Um, you can see uh, this, uh, this picture on the left here shows uh, their tracheal system. And usually if there's gills on stoneflies, they're usually attached to the tracheal system directly so that they can obtain lots of oxygen. And if they don't have gills, the tracheal system's usually attached to the membranous areas between the segments where, where the oxygen can diffuse directly into the tissues. So any place that we have moving water, uh, all flowing water, springs, high altitude snowmelt lakes, those usually don't have moving water unless there's a creek flowing on them, but they're cold. And so if the water isn't moving and you find stoneflies, it's usually in an environment where the water is fairly cold. Uh, it has higher oxygen. You also find them on waste shorelines of larger lakes. Uh, I've collected them on Lake Michigan and Lake Superior along the wave shore, swept shorelines, which is pretty interesting because you expect them to be a stream species, but um, we've also collected them in the snow melt lakes in the high altitudes, like in the Rockies. And you'll also find them in splash zones of waterfalls. So any place that's moving, any place that's highly oxygenated and the habitat is good. Um, importance of stoneflies, they're obviously an important uh, food source for a lot of fish and wildlife for a pretty wide variety of animals. And they're indicators of water and habitat quality. Uh, the Clean Water Act requirements usually are requiring uh, states to, to monitor the quality of their streams. And, and it's one of the insect groups that's really important in, in evaluating that, that quality. And because the winter species are not very uh, mobile, uh, they can only do a lot of crawling and they don't, they don't always fly very often in the winter time. They're, they're really a good indicator, indicator of past glacial dispersal patterns as well. So if you look at their distribution, you can kind of tell, uh, which, uh, places, uh, the, the stoneflies probably occurred in during the glaciated, uh, periods of time. And as the glaciers retreated, only the streams that had the habitats and the thermal regime uh, suitable for them uh, is the only places where they're found. Um, they're also sometimes referred to as sentinel organisms. Uh, they're sort of like, uh, you know, an indicator that if the stream conditions are good and they can survive pretty well, then chances are most other stream inhabitants are going to do pretty well too. Um, they're obviously imitated by fly fishers, as a lot of the other EPT uh, organisms are. And our, our pollution tolerance values for Missouri, not just at the species level, but also the family and genus level, they range from zero to two, zero, zero being the most sensitive and 10 being the least sensitive. And nearly all of our Missouri taxa are either a zero or a one. We've got a couple of, of of them that are classified as a two. So these are the most, among the most sensitive uh, uh, groups of, of insects that are in our streams. Stoneflies don't like these conditions. Uh, they don't like excessive uh, amounts of sedimentation in the stream. It can clog the interstitial spaces. They also don't like a lot of physical disturbance. Uh, sometimes physical disturbance has a tendency to decrease the hydrologic diversity in a stream. And they like to have uh, a lot of hydrologic diversity and in uh, places where the flow uh, varies. And sometimes that diversity can be removed by things like channelization. I also wanted to, to note uh, the picture in the upper left there shows a picture of a dam and uh, of all of the uh, the organisms that we find in our streams, they are probably as an order more sensitive to changes in and alterations in temperature than any other order. In fact, we have um, we've got some examples where where uh, a hydroelectric dam, because of how it uh, alters the temperature regime of the stream, can actually eliminate the entire order. Plecoptera because stoneflies have this, this real widespread uh, sensitivity to water temperature changes. And sometimes this effect can, it can be noticed 20, 30 miles downstream of a hydroelectric dam. Stoneflies will just be completely eliminated as an order. And, and we've seen this in several places across the country. 
They're important in food webs. Uh, they not only feed on on uh, the aquatic fungi and algae and diatoms that cover the surfaces of leaves and woody debris, but they also, as predators, will feed on other on other insect larvae, midges, small mayflies, and they're also fed upon as a food source by other organisms in the stream. Uh, crayfish uh, often feed on other aquatic insects as well as detritus, and sometimes crayfish will eat small stoneflies. And of course, uh, fish and other terrestrial uh, vertebrates such as nighthawks and bats and raccoons will also feed on, on stoneflies. So they are, they are an important part of our stream food webs and both inside the water and out. The nymphs is what we refer to the, the uh, immatures as nymphs. And the nymphs vary in size, shape, and color. Uh, sometimes they're they're rather drab looking and may blend in with their environment. Whereas other times they have a, a real striking contrast in color pigmentation. Um, and so it depends on it depends on the family. Uh, so we have a pretty big variety there across the families. The uh, the, uh, the top center of photo uh, picture that you'll see is the Peltoperlidae. They look kind of roach like. This is the one family of North America that we do not have in Missouri. Um, at least we've never, never been able to collect it. But uh, the nymphal stage is, is, is the stage that spends most of its time growing and feeding and spends more time uh, in the water most of their life cycle as nymphs. The adults are, are, are colored differently. They, uh, they're very similar in body shape, but of course, Instead of having wing pads, they have their full wings. And most of the species that emerge in the wintertime are black. They can absorb the sun's energy and they can really stand out on a light colored surface that way. And so um, most of our winter species are, are pretty dark colored. The summer species are more, are more colorful. They may blend in with their environment better. Um, the uh, lower right there, you'll see a chloroperlidae stonefly. These are usually yellow or green. And so they also will blend in with streamside vegetation. They got you know, a little bit of camouflage there to keep from being eaten by predators and so forth. So the spring and summer species in general are just more colorful as adults. Now, if you look at the, uh, the, the key to the families for stoneflies, the very first uh, breakout in the key couplets is based on the mouth parts. And these are the paraglossy and glossy of the labium, which is right underneath the head on stoneflies. If you look at these and you'll see that most of the, the most of the species that belong to the families on the left, these would be the perlidae, perlotidae, and chloroperlidae have the paraglossy much longer than the glossy. And these are most always predators or predaceous engulfers. They usually engulf the prey hole. Whereas the ones on the right, where the uh, paraglossy and glossy are even in length, these are mostly herbivore detritivores. And so you can see that these families here, they, they, you know, the stonefly families, the, the mouth parts are, are really key and they, and they really do have a, a relationship to what, what it is that they're eating out there. So this would be the first uh, first part of the morphology that you'll look at in the keys will be the mouth parts uh, of the labium. You also look at gills on stoneflies, presence or absence, and then also the location. Sometimes they can be located uh, on the underside of the head or the neck region. Sometimes they'll be in the thorax. Um, and then also the adult stoneflies will leave a, a scar or a remnant of a gill. Uh, underneath, and you'll you'll be able to see these uh, and the location of those uh, when you're when you're trying to identify the adults. Uh, you'll see in the upper right uh, picture there. We've even got the the Terranarsidae, which is a family that's our only family of stoneflies that actually has gills on the abdomen, only the first couple of segments of the abdomen, and you'll still see remnants or scars underneath the abdomen there where those gills were on the nymph. You know, after they emerge into the adult stonefly. We also use the legs for identification in the key, and specifically we look at the length of the tarsal segments. So if you look at the uh, the, the the segments of the first uh, two tars uh, tarsal segments, segments of the tarsi, the uh, number one and number two, they'll either be equal 
in length or that second tarsal segment will be a little bit shorter. Uh, so this, this is pretty easy to look at as long as you're looking at the leg from the side. Uh, we also have the wing pads, and these are the developing wings that are on the nymphs. We'll look at the shape and also how much they diverge from the center line. So if you were to take a, a straight line and draw it from, a, from, from head to tail, right down the middle of the thorax, uh, sometimes the wing pads will diverge away from that at an angle. And this is what we refer to as divergence in the keys. Sometimes they kind of sort of look like jet wings. Uh, this one here is a is the teeny opterigidae, and and they kind of sort of look jet like. The uh, the wing pads are divergent away from the center axis. But again, this this uh, wing pad characteristic is going to be the most useful on nymphs that are mature or close to mature, and that's what most of our keys are based on are mature specimens. So if you do have specimens that are that are uh, younger or have not grown uh, very much yet. The wing pads may not be visible and you may have to use other other characters to to ID them to family. We also use wings in the adults, the veins of the wings and also the coloration. And I'm not going to get into the, the adult keys very much, but that's one character we use a lot in the in the to key out the adult stages. Other uh, parts of the morphology, we also look at the uh, body features and they might be things like spines. Uh, sometimes spines will be found around the eyes or on the, on the back uh, edge of the, of the head region. Uh, sometimes this is used more for the genus level versus the family. Uh, we also can uh, look at the reproductive structures just to sex the adults. You can uh, find a what's a, a subgenital plate uh, on the females, whereas the males will usually have uh, uh, some exposed genitalia uh, on the, the abdominal segments at the end there, or, or they'll be tucked in underneath the body. Uh, so you can usually, uh, depending on the family, you can usually uh, sex the adults pretty easily uh, by looking at them. If you can, you know, you could even do this with a hand lens, as long as you could hold them still enough to be able to look at them, you can usually sex them, uh, you know, right out in the field. Another uh, body feature that is common in the keys is this uh, membranous uh, pleural fold that is right along the outer edge of the abdomen. If you, uh, if you look at the ventral side of the abdomen and uh, in the Capneidae, one of our winter families, this pleural fold goes all the way to the ninth abdominal segment, whereas in the Lutridae, it stops at the sixth or seventh abdominal segment. And again, this is a kind of difficult to see uh, on the immature nymphs, the ones that have not grown to, to full maturity yet. Uh, but on the, on the mature specimens that are just about to emerge, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to see. This, uh, this table is a table that I put together to complement the, uh, the key that you're going to have available for the families. And it basically just uh, is a, a, a one page uh, key that you can look at that is not a dichotomous key, but it just shows you that you can use a combination of these different characters that I just talked about to be able to place a, a stonefly nymph into a particular uh, family. You can see it on the columns here. We, we talked about the mouth parts, the glossy and paraglossy, whether they're equal in length or whether they're not equal. And then we also talked about the gills. Uh, there's uh, some families like the chloroperlidae never have gills, uh, whereas they're usually branched on the thorax and the perlids, and their perlodids may not have any, or they might have a single finger-like gill under the, the, the side of the head or the neck region. Um, and then you can also look at the Teneopterigidae, or the, one of the winter families. They're, they have a single, uh, sometimes have a single gill just on the coxy of each of the legs. Uh, so that's another location you can look at uh, on the gills. We also talked about the tarsal segments, the second tarsal segment being equal or unequal to the first, and the wing pads and their divergence from the body access and this pleural fold. And then also you can look at uh, for the summer emerging families, the perlids, perlodidae, and the chloroperlidae. You can also look at whether or not the nymphs are pigmented or not. Chloroperlids are always uh, pale, uniformly colored, 
whereas the perlids and perlotidae almost always have some kind of pigment contrast or coloration uh, to them. Uh, so uh, again, a combination of these characters can be used to place uh, any nymph in the correct family as long as it's mature enough for the characters to be able to show up well. So I'm hoping this table will complement the, uh, the key that you also have available in the link at the end of the presentation. I also uh, uh, made this uh, this table here that just kind of outlines some of the adaptations that stoneflies have. Um, I think they they're all adapted to uh, a flowing uh, water existence and and in a way that they can cling on to the substrate real easily because they have two tarsal claws. I think that helps them uh, stay in place uh, when they want to, and then also. Um, a lot of the perlotidae and the perlidae uh, nymphs, they usually have a broad, uh, very flattened uh, body. They because they can they can they're located in that boundary layer uh, where the current is a little bit slower. But that, in combination with the two tarsal claws, they're able to actually uh, cling onto a rock surface uh, very well without being swept away. So this is kind of an adaptation that they have for uh, you know for being able to stay in place. We also have the, the winter emerging families that do have an antifreeze substance in their body fluids to keep them from freezing. So the Catneidae and the Teneopterygidae and the Lutridae and some of the Nemiridae that emerge a little bit earlier, uh, they uh, are able to actually move around and emerge uh, in sub-zero uh, temperatures. They sometimes can be found crawling on the snow, uh, sometimes in a stream that's partially frozen over, they will actually emerge and crawl out of the hole in the ice and start crawling around in the snow. And so they actually have an antifreeze substance in their body fluids and their black coloration also uh, serves to absorb the sun's energy a little bit easier when they're on that contrasting background. Um, they also uh, have uh, camouflage. Uh, some of them can, uh, blend in with the habitat or the food that they're in. Sometimes the nymphs do, especially the the Terranarsidae, even though they're really large in size, sometimes you pull a, a leaf pack out of a stream and you don't realize there's one there until it starts moving because the, the dark coloration uh, of the of the Terranarsid nymphs kind of blends in with the leaf packs in the places where they're found. Um, and also the adult coloration, as I mentioned before, blends in a lot with the vegetation. And that's especially true for the summer emerging families in the perlids and perlotidae and the chloroperlidae, they're more likely to blend in with vegetation. They've got lots of browns and yellow and green color to them. And we also have in nearly every family, except for the Terranarsidae, um, they there are species that belong to every one of those other families that have a life cycle in, that includes an egg diapause. So they are actually able to resist the drying or desiccation or drought if the stream stops flowing, um, they can actually still uh, survive in the stream because they can avoid that dry period by by diapausing uh, at a resting stage as it, you know as the stage is as an egg. Um, stoneflies can be collected with a lot of different methods. Obviously, the different nets that you can use are pretty varied. You can also use a a, a, a sweep net for sweeping vegetation along the stream to collect the adults. Um, you can also put up traps. There's a, a trap here that's called a malaise trap, and it it's, uh, basically takes the place of what a tree canopy would be. You can set this up on a stream, and as soon as they, they get attached to the olive drab colored netting, they'll, they'll go try to go vertical, and they'll get trapped in the jar up on top. It's just one of the many types of sampling equipment that you can use for stoneflies. It works pretty well. And we've also found that in big rivers, you can use fisheries gear like a benthic trawl uh, to collect some of the habitats that are a lot more difficult to sample. And sometimes that's effective uh, too uh, for collecting stoneflies in the in the bigger you know bigger streams. And we also have a lot of stoneflies, especially in the summer months, that are attracted to lights. So a light trap uh, light trap is a really good way to collect them as well. When I was uh, a graduate student working on the stonefly project in the Ozarks, I did a lot of rearing. And that was because uh, a lot of the nymphal stages of stoneflies were at the time were not 
uh, known very well. We could not actually key them to the species level as a nymph. And if you bring the mature nymphs back with a, with a styrofoam cooler and you put them in an environmental chamber with some circulating water, I put them in these little wire baskets and you can actually rear the nymphs to the adult stage and then it gives you an association between the nymph and the adult since most of the species keys that are out there are based on the adult characters and the reproductive structures. This way you get all of the, the life stages there that you need to be able to ID the, the nymphs to, to species. So I did a lot of this and you can do that very easily. If you find nymphs in the stream that are pretty mature, you can actually put them in a styrofoam cup and sometimes overnight, just putting a cover on them, you'll have an adult stonefly in the morning. And this is, this is pretty easy to do. So this is the basic uh, life history traits of stoneflies. They have incomplete development. So they do not have a pupil stage as in the caddisflies. Uh, the, the nymphs uh, grow uh, to maturity and then uh, the adults usually have the same body shape but they'll usually change in coloration and then they'll have their, their, uh, their mature reproductive structures. Um, so there, it's considered an incomplete type of development or metamorphosis. And they also have indeterminate growth, which means that they do not have a set number of molts. So the, the number of molts uh, that they have as, they, as the nymphs grow varies quite a bit from anywhere from 15 to 25 different molts. And the growth might be either really, really fast or, or slow and gradual. Um, we do not have any stoneflies uh, uh, that we know of in North America that have more than one generation per year. Um, all of our stoneflies are either univoltine, which is one generation per year, or semivoltine, which refers to uh, a generation that may take two or three years for them to, to develop into the adult. And the diapause or resting stage may be of eggs, and we actually have a couple species where the nymphs also undergo a resting stage or a diapause too, and it may be present or absent depending on the, the species. The, the winged adults, most of the winter emerging species only live maybe one to two weeks, but the summer emerging species will live longer. Uh, we have some cases where we know that the adults have lived up to eight weeks. It's usually not quite that long. It's more like four to six weeks, but some of the summer emerging species are able to live a little longer as adults. And of course, this in comparison to the mayflies is quite a bit longer, where some mayflies only live as adults for a day or two. Uh, usually stoneflies are living longer than that. And they don't feed as an adult, but we do know that they take in fluids. They also have a, a communication behavior as the adults uh, where they have a, 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 this behavior is called drumming where they tap or rub their abdomen on a substrate uh, to locate mates. And I'll talk about that a, lo a little bit later. Um, so that's kind of an interesting behavior that's unique in stoneflies. And temperature is probably the most, the most important factor influencing the growth, the emergence times and the egg hatching and also the species presence is the water temperature is a real key uh, environmental factor. Here's just a basic stonefly life cycle. It's very similar to a lot of our other aquatic insects that don't have a pupil stage. Um, you have the adults, they may have a dispersal flight, uh, especially in the summer species, they may leave, for, leave go away from the stream pretty far. And then they deposit their eggs directly on the water surface most of the time. And then these eggs may hatch right away, or they may uh, undergo diapause and hatch several months later. And so all of their egg hatching and growth occurs in the, in the water, in the stream. That's where they, they spend most of their life cycle is in the water. And they will emerge by crawling out on a particular object. They will dig their tarsal claws into a substrate, either on a rock or a piece of vegetation or other solid objects, and they will pull out of their exuvia exoskeleton and, and then they will fly away. And uh, this, so this is a typical uh, life cycle of a, of a stonefly. It's pretty, pretty similar to, to those that, uh, that have the incomplete uh, development. Here's a picture of an adult stonefly and you can see on the end of the abdomen is a, is a cluster of eggs. And uh, sometimes the adult stoneflies will carry around uh, the eggs on the outside of their body when they've matured 
when they've been fertilized and when they're ready to lay into the stream. And so a stonefly adult will fly, land on the, on the stream and will release this glob of eggs into the water. Sometimes they'll hatch immediately and other times they'll undergo a diapause. And uh, it, for the winter species, they may have a, 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 an egg mass like this and they'll just usually walk back to the, you know, crawl back to the stream and they'll, and they'll lay their eggs right there at the water surface. Okay, most of you, uh, uh, well, looking at this picture here, would see an intermittent stream, and that's what this is. This is a stream that has turned uh, drying and is no longer flowing in late summer. Sometimes uh, streams in the Ozark region are like this for a couple of months of the year if we don't have any rainfall. And so uh, they'll they'll get pooled up in the summertime where all we have is standing pools. You can see the standing pool in the, in the background. And, and you may ask yourself, are there any stoneflies here? And you think, well, uh, because there's no moving water, uh, maybe there's no stoneflies here. Well, actually there, there are stoneflies here. And in that dry stream bed, in that gravel and in the sand and in the rocks there, we do have viable stonefly eggs that are undergoing a, a diapause of some kind. It may be a diapause that lasts for several months of the year. And as soon as the stream becomes hydrated again in late summer or fall, either due to rainfall or changes in the in the hydrology of the stream, where the stream will start flowing again, uh, these eggs will will hatch and and immediately start growing. And we've actually taken substrate from the stream and collected it and actually put it into stream water and into an environmental chamber where we can control the temperature and drop the water temperature uh, slowly. And we can actually get uh, stoneflies to, to start hatching from eggs and growing right into an environmental chamber. And that pretty much you know, shows that, that this, this, grout, this dry stream gravel is a viable producer of insects and just carries a life stage that happens to be a resting uh, stage when uh, that's an adaptation for these kind of uh, environments. Stoneflies are not the only ones that do that. We've got some other aquatic insects that do that as well, but stoneflies are one of the main groups that have that kind of a life cycle uh, adaptability. There have been some studies out there that have looked at the productivity of stoneflies in different habitats. And it's pretty interesting because um, even though they are found in stones and gravel and rocks, they're also, they also really like organic matter. And especially the ones that feed on, on, uh, on bacteria, algae, and fungi in the, in the stream, or they feed on leaf material. So we have a lot of them that are, that are classified as herbivores or tritivores. They're either shredders or they're scrapers. And, uh, and, and then we have some that are predators, and, we, and we've been able to document that they definitely do engulf their prey whole. But then we also have some omnivores as well, and they may start at one functional group, and they may start as an herbivore to tritivore, and as, as the nymphs grow and get larger, then they start switching over to another food source. So we have some that will do that as well. But there are some studies out there that have shown that stonefly production is actually higher in leaf packs than it is in gravel substrates. And that's true for some, for some species. So it's pretty interesting. We have stoneflies here, but sometimes they, they would prefer to be in the leaf packs. As long as the conditions in the leaf packs are good, they, they, they like to be there as well. The next uh, few slides, I just wanted to show you an example of some of the life cycles that stoneflies have. And so these next three graphs, the, the, uh, the, the axis on the left there says HCW, and that stands for head capsule width. And so we look at the width of the head capsule as a measure of growth. And then the arrows that you see signify when the stoneflies are emerging from the stream. And this is actually uh, shows a, a you know, year and a half, two year period of time. And this first one example here, is an example of Alcapnea, which is in the Capnea day. It's one of our winter emerging species. And it has a univoltine life cycle, one generation a year with very fast development, and it has an egg diapause. And you can see that if you are out in this stream from late March all the way till October, you would not know that these exist in the stream because they're in egg diapause during that whole year. And then as soon as the stream 
uh, starts dropping in water temperature and the leaves start falling in late October and November, these uh, stoneflies will hatch from the egg and start growing very rapidly. And they they're, they're adapted to take advantage of that new food source that is coming in from autumn leaf fall. And they, and they will concentrate on feeding on that. Uh, but they 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 are actually are, they're growing and feeding very very rapidly, and that's the reason why it's considered a fast life cycle. These things will will do their entire nymphal growth in just two months, and then before they start emerging, pretty interesting. And this is real typical of all, most all of our winter emerging families: the Capnia day and the Teneopteridae day, and some of the Lutridae. This next life cycle is univolting slow, one generation a year. And in this particular case, this is an example of a pearlid stonefly that emerges in late spring and summer. And in this particular case, the eggs hatch immediately when they're laying, when they've been laid in the stream. And the nymphs will start growing, but they'll grow a lot more slowly over the entire year. So in this particular case, you'll be able to go out there and get nymphs out of the stream any particular day of the year they just may be a different size depending on what year you're you're looking at them so that's a that's a difference and we see this a lot in the perlidae the third one i want to show you is a a semi-voltine life cycle where it takes two years for the stoneflies to develop and and some of the examples we have of this type of life cycle are the eastern salmon salmon fly which is our our large terranarsid stoneflies and then some of the the perlite stoneflies that are found in the cooler uh, trout streams. And as you can see here, the emergence is about the same as some of the other perlids in May and June, but then the, the nymphs actually take two full years to develop. So you can go out in this stream and you may find two fairly distinct size classes of stonefly nymphs of this one species because they take longer for them to grow before they emerge. This is a, an emergence chart that was uh, put together uh, in the 1980s on a study that was done in a little third order stream uh, in northeastern Oklahoma. It's actually an, uh, an Ozark stream that's fairly diverse, a little third order stream that was studied pretty extensively. And uh, the white bars signify when the winged adults are present of each one of these species. And you can see that this stonefly species that are here stagger their life cycles out over the entire year. And a lot of them are, are overlapped. So there's times where you can go out and, and collect more than one species at a time. But one of the things I wanted to show you on this is that if you have a small weightable stream that is in good shape, and it's good quality and has good habitat with a good diverse stonefly community, you can find a winged adult stonefly species of some species, at least one species, every single day of the calendar year, all the way across the, the entire year, you'll find at least one species that has emerged if you look in the right place, which is pretty, pretty cool. Here's another thing that we have that really controls the stonefly distribution. We have these springs in Missouri that are really large and they usually come out of the ground at a fairly uniform temperature. And this was a graph that I put together in my graduate uh, uh, studies that I did on stoneflies. And you can see that uh, on our larger streams that have, that are moderated by the spring flow, um, they actually end up being cooler in the summertime and a little bit warmer in the wintertime. So this black solid line indicates the streams that don't have any spring influence at all, whereas the dotted line shows the streams that do have a spring influence. And you can see that it moderates the the annual uh, temperature fluctuation. As it turns out, the upper part of this more closely emulates what we find in more northern latitudes and in, in, in the north central US. And this is the very phenomena in the Ozarks that allows certain stonefly species to exist in Missouri and in the rest of the Ozarks where they wouldn't normally be there. It's because these large springs we have keeps the river, the, the streams. Uh, cooler. And so even though the stoneflies might not be very common in the springs themselves, it's in the larger receiving streams where the water temperature is moderated by these springs that are important to some of these species. And we see this in places like the Current River and the Jacks Fork and the Eleven Point River, the North Fork and the Spring River, 
with some of the other streams that we have that are larger that have a lot of spring flow. So this is kind of really tells us how we can get some of these stonefly species that may they really be more common in more northern latitudes. So you'll have a distribution map that looks something like this, where they might be a lot more common in these streams up here further north, but then you've got these geographically isolated populations of these species that are only found in the cooler streams in the Ozarks. So they end up being actually glacial relic populations. And the only way they can remain here in Missouri is the springs keeping the water cooler. And of course, this also coincides with a lot of our trout waters, places where trout are being are being uh, stocked and where, where trout are, are thriving or, and are being caught by, by fishermen. This is here. I wanted to show you one example of a species of conservation concern. We've got this uh, capneid stonefly, um, and the common name for this one is the pygmy snowfly. Uh, this particular species is kind of unique in Missouri. It's a, a conservation concern li uh, listed species, and it actually has diapause as a nymph. And it's only found in the permanently flowing streams with the cooler water temperatures. And you can see how geographically isolated the populations in Missouri are versus the other uh, populations we know of in North America. And they're pretty far away and probably have been isolated geographically for, for hundreds of years uh, since the, uh, the last uh, glacial event. And so this, this can kind of tell us a, a, some, a, some good information on where those glacial dispersal patterns might have been. And, and part of that is just because the capneid stoneflies are real limited in their, in, their, uh, in their dispersal capabilities. As you can see that the males usually have short abbreviated wings and even the females with the full size wings, they, they really can't fly very well. They depend on being able to crawl. And so they can't move very far and because they can't fly and they don't have dispersal flights, they stay fairly, fairly close to the stream. So this is kind of typical of a lot of our winter emerging uh, species. They, they may have uh, limited capabilities on flight. And so they're good indicators of past glacial dispersal patterns. I wanted to give you just a few stonefly fun facts here that I put together. Um, as far as diversity, this is pretty interesting. I mentioned this stream, this Ozark foothill stream that Ernst and Stewart studied back in the 80s where they found 22 species in one stream and that was a, a two-year study. But recently, this number was exceeded. A, uh, a study was done on Jones Creek in the so southwestern part of Missouri in Newton and Jasper counties and, and they found 29 species of stoneflies in one stream. And that's the highest diversity that I know of in any stream system that we that we have in, in Missouri. Um, and they, they collected several sites over a multi-year period of time and were able to get all those species identified. And then in, in the study that I worked on in graduate school, um, I had a particular collection that was done on a stream in Arkansas where I collected 16 species in just one collection. And so this was a single collection at a single site uh, in March of 1985, where we found 16 species, and more than half of those were, were found on a bridge collection as winged adults. The rest of them were in the stream as nymphs. So that's a lot of diversity in one collection, and it kind of gives you an idea about what time of year you might go out and collect uh, uh, stoneflies and find the highest diversity. It's usually in that late winter, early spring period where it basically intersects a lot of the life cycles uh, all together uh, where most of the species are emerging. Stoneflies have this really unique uh, uh, communication behavior where they can rub or tap their abdomen on a, on a hard surface uh, to create a vibration that is picked up by the, by the mates. And each one of these stonefly species that has a drumming behavior actually has their own distinct signals We've actually been able to measure this on an oscilloscope where you can actually look at the, the number of beats and the beat interval. It's pretty interesting. And we can actually use it to delineate species. Uh, this is one of the reasons why the Plecoptera are considered kind of close relatives to a lot of the Orthoptera, uh, the order of Orthoptera, which includes our grasshoppers and crickets and katydids, is because they are big sound producers and they also have some other similarities with that order. 
And so this is a primitive uh, behavior uh, in stoneflies that's, that's fairly unique. The winged adult stages of our summer species can disperse for miles. Um, the previous presentation on mayflies mentioned that too, is that even though mayflies don't live a long time, sometimes they can get blown uh, off course by the wind and sometimes on a very hot windy night, sometimes these big disper dispersal flights will occur in stoneflies and they can get uh, you know, blown around for a long, long time. I collected a, a, a Missouri River species in Sedalia one time at a gas station pump. And I, I was really surprised to see it that far from the, from the river, but these things uh, do have dispersal flights a lot of times in the evenings and, and they come off, you know, it will emerge in really large numbers. And it's especially, uh, you can see this when we're, when we're out using a light trap uh, in the, in the evening hours, where you can set this up right at dusk and you can get really large numbers when the, when the stoneflies are, are there and present at, at high numbers. The other thing that, uh, that is really interesting is to go out in the winter months in January and February and collect winter stoneflies off of bridges. And bridges are a really good place to collect as long as it's safe to, to collect there. Uh, some of the bridges uh, are are down, you know, have usually a pillar that there is down in the water column. And of course, they'll back up with debris. And so the, the winter stoneflies will emerge from that. And they have a tendency to want to climb to ele elevated positions. And I've actually collected some of these winter species on bridges that were pretty high up above the, the stream. So they, they are big crawlers. And they, they will crawl for pretty for pretty uh, high uh, distances. Uh, bridges end up being an interceptor of their uh, emergence behavior. So um, if you do have a bridge there in a stream, they're good to, places to collect because they're easy to see. But they also usually will intercept them because they think there may be they crawling up a tree, but they're actually crawling up a, the pillar of a bridge or something. And then when they end up being in an elevated position. They can gather the sun's energy a little bit easier and, be, and remain active during during the day. So they end up being some pretty good uh, places to collect. Here's an interesting uh, uh, account in the literature. Um, Stephen Hitchcock, who who published the Stoneflies of Connecticut back in 1974, he mentions in his introduction to his book that there was a, a schoolhouse positioned really close to a stream. And they had left the windows open in the schoolhouse and a large emergence of one of the winter stoneflies crawled in and got inside the schoolhouse and they they considered it a nuisance and most of the people that had seen this emergence did not even know what kind of insects they were but it was kind of interesting an interesting account that this occurred just because the schoolhouse was positioned really close to the to the stream here's a very interesting species uh, i don't know if any of you have been out to lake tahoe but Lake Tahoe, of course, is this large uh, lake out there in the west uh, that is uh, is drained mainly by snow melt, so it never really gets very warm. We have a species of Capnea day. This is Eutacapnea uh, tahoensis. Uh, this particular Capnea species can uh, undergo its entire life cycle underwater without actually ever leaving the water. So the nymphs will will uh, hatch from eggs, grow and feed underwater. They will actually molt into the adult stonefly. They, they don't have any wings, but they will mate underwater and lay their eggs underwater so they can undergo their entire life cycle underwater in Lake Tahoe without ever actually leaving the lake. They don't ever have to crawl out. Usually stonefly emergences are not very conspicuous next to some of the other insect groups. Um, in fact, the casual observer might never notice them. One exception is the Western salmon fly, and this is one of our largest stone flies. Um, these are like two and a half inches uh, long as adults. Uh, we have a closely related species in the Ozarks. We have the Eastern salmon fly that's very, very similar, and that's found real commonly in the Current River and in the, in the Levin Point and, so, and the Merrimack River and some other places. Uh, but this is the one of the more conspicuous hatches that we find in our in our rivers and out west. You usually find it in the larger streams, and it happens usually right after snow melt. But there's a huge economic impact uh, associated with this emergence because uh, there's resorts and fishing guides and float trip outfitters and fly fishermen. They all benefit from this hatch, and a lot of people will plan their vacation time 
around this event just so that they can be there when they're hatching and have the chance of catching large trout with their fly fishing gear. So it's a very, very interesting hatch. I've been uh, out there out west during the middle of one of these hatches and it's really astounding to see these large insects crawl out of the water and the numbers that they that they're present in. And you know, again, we've got an eastern salmon fly version in the Ozarks that's a little bit smaller, but it's culture related. And if you know right where to go and what time of year they emerge, uh, it's pretty interesting to, to see them. Um, there are reports that some streams have had a decline in the hatch because of drought and dewatering and some of the temperature changes, which is kind of sad, but this is a a, a real a real big hatch and a very significant one uh, for North America. We've also seen really interestingly, uh, some uh, photographer latched a hold of the of the salmon fly hatch and took photographs of stoneflies mating of these salmon flies mating and actually used it for an advertisement for fishing gear. And so you see this here is an advertisement to sell uh, fly rods. And, uh, and it's pretty, pretty interesting to see this because rare is it that adult stoneflies are ever uh, found or featured in an advertisement. Usually you're more likely to see that in a mayfly or a dragonfly rather than a stonefly. It's just not very commonly seen. And in fact, most people don't take pictures of the adults. It's just something you don't see very often. This is another interesting phenomenon. We have a plant in Missouri that's considered a riparian species. It's called Ozark witch hazel. And Ozark witch hazel is actually our earliest blooming plant that we have in the Ozarks along our streams. These things will flower and bloom in late January through February into early March. And it, they are thought to be pollinated by some group of insects. But there's been few of any attempts to actually be able to document what insects are responsible for pollinating this plant. And it's always been suspect that winter stoneflies may have a role since they are about the most active winter emerging insects there are uh, during that period of time. And since this is a riparian species, they may very well crawl up and get into the, the, the flowers and on the flowers and on, on this plant in large enough numbers where they may actually passively uh, be able to pollinate this particular species. It's pretty interesting. If any of you have ever been out in the wintertime and seen this blooming, it's an interesting phenomenon to see a plant blooming like this when there's sometimes still snow on the ground. Yes, this is a creek course, but we do have some big river stoneflies. And we've, we've got a few species that are are restricted to our, our very biggest streams. Uh, they're found only in the Missouri and the Mississippi rivers, and they can be collected if you are there at the right time and if the water level hasn't fluctuated very much. Um, so it is pretty interesting to see that they're not only found in headwater streams and everything in between, but they're also found in our, in our big rivers as well. So just in summary on the stoneflies, a kind of a take home summary, there's it's a major diet item to a lot of animals that we like. Um, uh, bats just love them. Some of the bats that feed in, at dusk, uh, right when the large stoneflies are emerging in the summertime, they'll feed pretty heavily on these. I've been to some streams before when I've been light trapping and you could see the, the activity of bats in the stream corridors pretty high along some of these streams and they probably, stoneflies are probably one of the major food sources for them, but they don't just like stones either. We've, you know, we've seen that, that they also do like other stream habitats besides stones and cobbles. And their success really is tied to their life history requirements, especially water temperature and water quality. Um, and, but in, in general, their hatches are more secretive and less conspicuous than what you might see with mayflies or caddisflies. Um, the casual observer may be on a stream with a lot of stoneflies and not really even know that they're emerging unless they, they really look closely for them because they just usually are not as conspicuous or as obvious as other groups. Um, but the, the most interesting thing I think is the fact that we've got a lot of our species that are emerging in the winter months and people just miss them if they're not out there at the right time looking for them. And, and they are among the most active winter emerging insects that you will ever find on the stream. And even if they stay close by to the stream and they're hard to find, if you know where to look for them, you definitely will find them if you're there at the right time. And 
they are associated with a lot of our more, more unspoiled places that we like to visit. Um, their presence is associated with clean water, uh, maybe perhaps more than, than most other groups. I wanted to mention a few books that you might find out there that are interesting uh, for stoneflies. There's one on fishing here that is stoneflies for the angle, angler, which is you know, for people who like to fly to do a lot of fly tying. It's a good book that was uh, that was devoted specifically to stoneflies. There's another one here that's a photographic book of stoneflies. It has a lot of really good pictures of, of nymphs and adults. Um, and this one is uh, is still uh, available, even though it's out of print. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's still copies available. Um, and then the 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 most definitive work on the nymphal stages to be able to key anything in North America down to genus is the Stewart and Stark book uh, from 2002, which is the Nymphs of North American Stonefly Genera. This one is also out of print, but uh, there are lots of copies available uh, to be able to buy this if you want to. It's the most definitive work there is on the nymphs. It also has a nymphal key for North America that's very similar to the one that you'll get here at the end of this talk that it just includes uh, some of the other taxa that you find in the in the Rockies and the Appalachians that we don't have here in the Ozarks. These are, are three books that you should uh, look for if you're if you're more interested in, in seeing in learning more about about stoneflies. And I have the references here that I used in this presentation and I guess I'm ready to entertain questions. All right. Yes, we had some really good questions come through the chat. So I'll see if I can address all of them the best I can. So I'm going back up. Give me a moment. I think this one might have been answered, but um, there was an indication that the eggs are a little less temperature sensitive than the nymphs and the adults. Um, and that, that would have been early on in the presentation. Yeah, they probably are just simply because of it. They they usually are in a resting stage at that point, and because they're able to to you know withstand the effects of drying and desiccation, um, they they probably are not as sensitive to temperature as as what the, the nymphs are. This would be something that might be kind of difficult to study too, because uh, you'd have to do a lot of uh, laboratory studies to really be able to tell what their sensitivity is. Um, I think the temperature sensitivity has been studied more in the nymphs than, you know, than the eggs have, but that's what I would suspect. Right, and we have a couple part question here from Ron. Um, are stoneflies a more developed species than mayflies? Um, they seem more developed and have more variety, um, but are all the EPTs about the same? Is there a progression in these three groups? So between the the stoneflies, mayflies, and the caddisflies. As far as uh, I, I, I guess, uh, would this be uh, sort of like uh, for adaptations that maybe they're they're more they're more adapted? Um, I'm guessing or, is that what they mean by I, I'm I'm guessing morphologically or um, you know historically as primitive versus more advanced. I, I think actually there, uh, if you look at the, uh, the evolution, evolutionary tree that I have seen and where the plecoptera falls within the insect orders, I think it is considered more primitive uh, than advanced. Um, you, you've actually got some, you know, you've got some species that are there that, that are more advanced uh, in, in certain ways, but I think as in general, as a group, they're considered more primitive than some of the other uh, stream insects. Okay, um, is there a minimum stream flow required for the eggs to hatch? Uh, actually, we do not know that. Um, there's there has has not been very many or really few, if any, studies done on on uh, on the the egg hatching. Uh, requirements as far as flow. I think uh, there's been more done on temperature than there has been on on uh, on flow. Um, oh, that's the, a perfect uh, segue to the next question. Yeah. <laughs> um, on what is the temperature, the water temperature range for stoneflies? 
Well, uh, some of the summer species can withstand all the way up till 30 degrees C, which is our about our maximum that we usually see in most of our streams. And they, they can handle that, that, that temperature. Some of the summer emergent species can, but, but even, even amongst those few summer emerging species that can handle it, they, they usually have a tendency to emerge as an adult before they ever, those streams ever reach those, those higher uh, temperatures. Um, there's some stoneflies that will emerge right before the stream dries up or right before it stops flowing. If it's going to be an intermittent stream, and sometimes that's when these streams will attain their highest water temperatures is right before they stop flowing. And uh, a lot of times this, the, the, the stoneflies are, are ready to, to emerge if they haven't already emerged. And, and we see this with some other insect groups too as well, not just stoneflies, is that is that uh, if it's going to pool up during the summer, a lot of the insects will, will be there along the water's edge and ready to emerge before the temperatures would actually ever get up that high. Okay, great. Um, another interesting question is, wouldn't water below dams kind of mimic the temperature of spring fed streams in attracting a more diverse species distribution? In some ways, uh, yeah, yes, they would, uh, but um, it, it depends on the degree of, of mixing and also the design of the dam and also how large the impoundment is behind it and what the residence time is. So those are all things that, that, that can make a big difference there on the, on the thermal regime. The, the springs that moderate the, the temperatures don't do it exactly the same way as a dam does. Uh, parts of the of the thermal regime might be similar, but maybe not all of it. And and this is this really varies quite a bit. Um, I've seen some dams with small impoundments behind them that don't have any release from the lower levels of the of the reservoir, you know, of the uh, of the impoundment that have very little effect uh, because the the temperature really won't change very much. But then there's others, especially the larger bodies of water, that have the mixing between the top and lower parts of the lake. Um, sometimes that that varies with the way that they that they regulate the flows below the dam. And that that's where sometimes where the differences are. So it just depends. Depends on the on the, the situation. And uh, that actually leads into the next question uh, pretty well. Uh, because they're so sensitive to temperature, is climate change having a large effect on them? Uh, I think there, if I remember right, there have been some proposals for research projects to that effect, uh, in particular, uh, looking at some of the stoneflies that are in the high elevations that, that depend on the cooler uh, water temperatures. And we would expect that those that are kind of on the fringe of their, of their thermal uh, tolerance would be the ones that might be affected first uh, from climate change. And, and so, um, I think there's been a few studies out there now that have looked at that, but these are also studies that may need to be multi-year to really be able to see the effect too, because uh, because sometimes you've got a, a big enough difference between one year and the next that it's hard to make a definitive uh, conclusion on that. I I think there have been a couple of cases that are documented where the where the stonefly community has shifted. A little bit uh, in some streams that where the where the water has warmed up, where we've seen a decline in the populations of certain species, and maybe an increase in others. Uh, so there's been a couple of cases there where that that's been looked at out west, especially where you've got lots of irrigation and places where the streams uh, uh, end up dropping and flows quite a bit, where the temperature ends up going up. So um, there's there's a lot to do there. Uh, it, it, and, and stoneflies would be a really good group to study uh, for those kinds of effects because of their thermal sensitivity. I, I, I don't recall that there's, there's been anything real definitive, but I do remember some proposals that I've seen, some research proposals that I've seen to that effect to, to kind of look at some of these, these, uh, these different uh, aquatic taxa that, that are, are you know, sensitive to temperature, they would be the first ones to show the effects if you were going to look for it. Great, and I think that might have answered some of the following questions, but we'll see. Um, but I have one that's a little bit different. 
um, are the nymphs of the winter species um, that we have in M Missouri also black in color like the adults, um, or do the adult does the adult color not correlate to the nymphs? I, I think you might have addressed a little bit of that. Yeah, that seems to be the biggest change a lot of times when these stoneflies emerge from a nymph to adult is that the body shape stays about the same, but the coloration changes. And in the in the winter stone flies, the, the nymphs are usually fairly drab colored anyway. They usually blend in with their environment and they're usually a tan or a brown color of some kind, or it'll reflect on what it'll reflect what they're eating. You know, if you collect them in a leaf pack, they, they usually look fairly uniform colored. But then as soon as they emerge, they turn black. And so uh, that transformation there between the nymph and the adult, but it's the coloration that you usually see that's the, the most the most striking difference. And that's true, I think, even in the spring species too as well. Uh, we do have uh, the Teneopterygidae do have uh, some species that, that are largely black in color. Uh, uh, sometimes they'll have a little bit of color contrast or, or coloration difference, but um, but most of the time it's the it's the adults that are strikingly different in color a lot of times than you know they'll be all black or nearly all black uh, you know after they emerge. Okay. Um, so are adult stoneflies in Missouri still able to stay submerged in the water or do they have to stay along the sides and exposed parts of the streams? So I think you mentioned that's an a little bit. Yeah, about some of the, the Lake Tahoe stoneflies that do their entire life cycle in the water. So I, uh, that might be what that question is referring to. Yeah, that, that's an interesting question because uh, um, I, I guess it has been documented that some stoneflies will, especially the ones that crawl and maybe are not flying uh, as much, these would be the ones that emerge earlier in the year, They'll crawl to the edge of the stream and may actually crawl under the water part way before they deposit their eggs. Uh, the summer species are more likely to land on the water in flight and drop the egg mass at the water surface, but the winter species a lot of times will, you know, they'll leave their egg mass either right on shore next to the water line or underneath it. They will actually crawl under the water to to leave their egg mass behind slightly, but. The other thing that's really interesting is it's been documented that the Terranarsis stoneflies, our big, our big eastern salmon fly stoneflies, have actually been found to uh, to uh, crawl out of the water when they're ready to emerge, and if the air temperature is not warm enough, they'll crawl back in. And it's it's pretty interesting to to hear about that, but apparently that's been that's been observed by several people, and so. You know they're they're sensitive to water temperature, but also the air temperature as well. Uh, you know there are some stoneflies that, for whatever reason, they they have uh, a, a propensity to, you know maybe they they think that well if I emerge now the 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 air is temperature is going to be too cold, I'll just wait. And so we have some nymphs that will, especially the Terranarsis stoneflies, they'll crawl out of the water to emerge, and if the air temperature is too cool, they'll crawl back in and wait until the air temperature is warm enough to actually split their exoskeleton the last time before they, they end up in the wing stage. And so that, you know, there's, there's, we don't know very much about what some of the other species do as far as their behaviors. Um, and sometimes it's because it's hard to observe them in their natural habitat. That's, that's really interesting. I'm, I'm learning a lot from this too. That's awesome. Um, another question is, uh, are stoneflies globally found in freshwater areas only? Are they found in estuaries or saltwater areas? Uh, as far as I, as far as I know, we do not have any documented cases where, where stoneflies are in, are in brackish water or any water with salt intrusion. So they are, are they are freshwater only. Um, I, I do not know of any, any cases that where where we've got any saltwater intrusion there where we would find any stoneflies. And can stonefly eggs survive a short time frozen? Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever looked at that. Um, I I would I would think that they they might be able to. Some some of these winter species, the 
the egg masses end up end up dropping off the insect before it gets in the water. So I always wondered what happens with those with those eggs because I, I've collected winter stoneflies off the bridge before, and some of them just you pick them up when you collect them, and the egg mass mass drops off. And I always wondered what the fate of those eggs are. I don't know if anyone's looked at that. Um, it would be something that would be interesting to you know to look at because it, it probably happens uh, a, a lot more with the winter you know with the winter species. Sometimes they don't they don't make it back to the stream. So then what happens to those eggs? And that's a that's a good question. I don't think we know what the answer to that is totally. Right. Well, and kind of re related to that, but uh, conversely is um, you know when we have a heavy flood. Um, as we've had uh, the last couple of weeks, especially here in mid Missouri, um, doing our biological monitoring, um, you know, can be impacted by the flood. And, and so what would you suggest as far as after a heavy rain, um, like we had here in Columbia, we had three and a half inches um, for doing your, your biological monitoring, like how long would you suggest to let the creek settle and let the invertebrates kind of come back? Um, they used to suggest four to six weeks before the stream community would reach some kind of equilibrium again. Um, it may be less than that for some streams. And part of it depends on how on, on how high the water got, how much scouring there was in the stream channel. Um, and uh, and so it really does vary, but that I, I think that's in some of the protocols and some of the monitoring protocols out there. Uh, they they suggest a four weeks minimum, uh, simply because uh, uh, you know it takes it may take that long before the communities actually actually get relatively stable again, um, and and that that of course can vary uh, based on the you know based on the magnitude of the flood. Right, and I and I think as far as the stream team program goes, um, I generally suggest at least a week um, after an urban stream flood um, simply because the streams are flashy that they're going to come back down to a safe level um, without additional precipitation. But that can vary depending on what kind of watershed, um, if it's well vegetated, well forested, um, that that can be very variable depending on the type of stream. So I hope that answers that question. And I think that's about all we've got uh, for today. And so again, I thank you all for joining us today. Feel free to email any of us with any additional questions. Um, again, there will be a drawing for um, a copy of the Merritt and Cummins Introduction to Aquatic Insects of North America book uh, for those who stuck around long enough for uh, the entire presentation. So. Thank you again, and uh, we'll see you on Tuesday, hopefully. Yep, thank, thank you everybody for coming. Barry, that was an outstanding job. Well done. Thank you.